know Gravel Hill was known as Gravelly Hill? There used to be gravel up and down the road and they call it Gravelly Hill and they changed it to Gravel Hill. This is how I got its name, Gravel Hill. History books never mention about Gravel Hill history. We have a history that needs to be told. We've managed to survive through the Civil War, through Jim Crow. Gravel Hill's a mystery. It's a well-kept secret. Uh, been here for 240 years and nobody really knew about us. We are the oldest black settlement in America. Gravel Hill is a large family built on faith. Gravel Hill sits tucked away in eastern Henrico County, bearing only humble monuments to its extraordinary history. Among the rustic surroundings are a scattering of modest homes, a small church, and an old school building. But if you listen to longtime residents or reflect on a pair of historical markers, you begin to understand the community's history of struggle and perseverance and appreciate its grit, determination, self-reliance, and pride. This place is so rich in history and it's like an untold story. One of those secrets, just as they say, Veron is the best kept secret in Henrico County. We think Gravel Hill is the best kept secret in Verona. The story of Gravel Hill begins in 1771 with the death of a wealthy Quaker and plantation owner named John Pleasance. Guided by his religious convictions, Pleasance had become increasingly opposed to slavery. In his will, he stipulated that each of his slaves would be freed at the age of 30. The bequest was extraordinary for its time. It would be five more years before the colony sought independence from England and nearly a century before President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, declaring that all slaves in the Confederate States were free. Pleasant's son, Robert, dutifully executed his father's will but met fierce resistance from family members. The ensuing legal case, Pleasance versus Pleasance, was settled in 1777. It upheld John Pleasance's desire to free his slaves, but a major obstacle remained, Virginia law. In 1782, Robert Pleasance helped convince state legislators to pass a manumission law. That allowed Pleasance to give 78 former slaves 350 acres of his plantation to live and grow their own food. The property became known as Gravel Hill. With the ideas of freedom and equality coming out of the revolution, people started to question the institution of slavery. And a lot of religious groups like the Quakers uh, started to move away from that. And so that's what causes Pleasance to free his slaves. So there was a, a window when slavery is being questioned but that window will close. The thing that gets me is every time they left the area, they were in danger. They were confronted by people who were uh, hunting down sl uh, runaway slaves. And then when they went into town to sell the vegetables, they had to have, have paper to say that they were freed. They had to go through all of these uh, changes just to uh, survive and sell the crops and, do, and sell the charcoal and things that they made in the area. It's amazing that they survived. Um, some of them probably were pressed back into slavery. Some of them uh, were, they faced hardships. The only thing that I think that really saved them were the schools that the Quakers created. In 1784, Robert Pleasance established the Gravelly Hill School to teach writing and other basic skills, as well as the importance of virtue and religion. Gravelly Hill is considered to be the first school for free blacks in Virginia. There were things that uh, were, were taught in this school that allowed them to uh, deal with the, uh, the outside world. They did realize that education was key. What to get in your head, you can't take it away from you. Gravelly Hill School prospered until 1830 when Virginia passed a law prohibiting schools for blacks, free or slave. I think they had to watch out for each other. And in, in a community, that's what you do. You watch out, you take care of each other. So when they were, yet, yet they were free, but yet they were not. They were isolated 
and uh, states like Virginia had regulations that controlled the movements and the activities of these people. Uh, for example, they couldn't vote uh, or run for election. They couldn't own firearms. Uh, they had limited ability to assemble and, and have meetings. They were part of society, but in a separate way. The nation's tension soon boiled over. By 1862, the Civil War threatened to split the Union of States and had nearly destroyed Gravel Hill. On June 30th, Union troops held a strategic crossroads near Glendale Farm and were retreating south through Gravel Hill when Confederate forces attacked. The conflict became known as the Battle of Glendale. Two brothers, Richard and Isaac Sykes, own farms that are really going to be at the epicenter of the battlefield. Uh, both sides are going to uh, cross and, and, and take over their farms. The battle is technically a draw. But at the end of the day, the Confederates have not achieved their objective, and the Union Army has. The Union Army is able to pass through and get away from here that night. A day of desperate fighting is how one Union soldier described it. We know that both sides, Union and Confederate, would have plundered the, the farms, taking livestock, taking uh, crops from the fields, taking food that was available, because both armies needed it, and uh, the civilians powerless to, to stop it. It was a hard time and they actually had to go and hide in the woods and, and, um, and to just to survive. Some of the houses uh, they took over as hospitals and they came in, when they came back there was blood all over the walls, limbs buried in the yards uh, from the soldiers uh, they had amputated the arms and legs. It was, uh, it was something that nobody should ever have to live through, much less see. To be forced out of your house, to have to live in the woods just to survive, uh, it's, it's just amazing to me. I just can't picture it in my mind. We came back and reestablished our roots at that time. And most people would just pick up and move, but this is our home. Despite devastating property losses, residents of Gravel Hill hung on to the promise of freedom and began to rebuild. It was not easy. Isaac Sykes filed a claim for more than $2,000 in damages to his farm, which included the loss of a horse, cow, crops, and fence rails. His award from the government totaled only $303. You look at it and you go, like, how did they do it? You know, how did they come back to this neighborhood and rebuild? But they did. They came back because I guess this was home. This is all they knew. So they came back and they rebuilt the community and then that's the way they survived. What kept us safe? I always thought that God had a fence built all around us. He protected us. Because I was wondering how they lived through all of that. Whether it was divine intervention or simply faith, the Gravel Hill community resolved to pull together and make itself stronger. Gravel Hill Baptist Church, founded in 1866, became a backbone of the community. The history stated they met at a bush harbor, that therefore it was an area somewhere, I assume in the woods, where they met, and they, they just talk about God's goodness. And it was more of hope and more of faith. So our first pastor of Gravel Hill Baptist Church was a white minister. And that was from Four Mile Creek. And then after him, we got a, uh, a black minister to be the pastor of Gravel Hill Baptist Church. We knew about Christ. We knew about Jesus. We knew about how to get along. We knew about his divine intervention. We knew about that. But the reading of the Bible became more um, important during that time. We knew there was a time for everything and there a purpose for what he had in mind for us of, of people of Gravel Hill. It's important to know that um, the church was founded by people who believed that there was a greater good, there was a, uh, a being greater than we are. And uh, through that faith and that, that love and feeling, they created Gravel Hill Baptist Church. The end of the Civil War brought a renewed interest in education. 
In Gravel Hill, the philanthropy of Anna Jeans, a Quaker from Philadelphia, proved key. Virginia Randolph, the daughter of a former slave, became Henrico's first Jeans teacher. She supervised its schools for blacks, including two in Gravel Hill, the Sydney School and the Gravel Hill School. About 1930, the one-room Gravel Hill School was replaced by a larger brick school. Local children gathered there for their lessons from first through seventh grades until 1955. The school is now a community building owned by Gravel Hill Baptist Church. They planted the seed here to know that there was a better life uh, out there be, to be found. Virginia Randolph was the supervisor of the uh, colored schools in, the, in Hiraka County, and uh, she used to visit uh, at least two to three schools a day uh, by horse and buggy. And uh, she'd go, go around to the schools to make sure that the quality of the education was what it should be. We call it the Fravel Hill Center of Verona. is a uh, Rosenwald School. We're in the process, hopefully, of getting it put on the National Registry as a historic landmark. Following the Supreme Court's 1954 landmark ruling in Brown v. Board of Education, Henrico began to desegregate its public schools. That helped connect Gravel Hill to other communities. But even as some barriers fell, residents had to face the challenges and injustices perpetuated by Jim Crow laws. As it had before, the community leaned on family and faith. You can never tell the story about Gravel Hill without the church. It's through faith that we have gotten this far. And I'm, I am thankful. I'm thankful to God and to our church and to our community. This is one big community of family. You have family where you related by blood, and then the onesie twosies that are not actually related, they're still family. We have people in the community that we call aunts and cousins who really aren't our aunts and cousins, but because we're that close, it's just family. The church is the strength and faith of this community. It's my foundation where I gather my strength and uh, my draw from the history of Gravel Hill to make it from day to day. Gravel Hill is, is what in our hearts. It's the best kept secret that I've ever been in Verona is Gravel Hill. And nobody knew about it, but now it looks like we're bursting at the scene. Everybody wants to know about Gravel Hill. <laughs> We're at the Atkins Pleasant Cemetery. Today we're trying to clean up and preserve our, part of our history. It's important to the community that my mama used to say, uh, you don't know where you're going until you know where you've been. So it's important to know where your relatives are, uh, where they, uh, what they accomplished in life, so that you can build on that. We're cleaning the cemetery to keep our heritage alive. We, we are trying to strive to uh, preserve that, that history. These are my founding fathers. These are the people who established this. I knew there was a cemetery, but because it was so dirty, I never had the privilege of seeing it and seeing the connection to people. So it means a lot to me that I don't have to, my generation doesn't have to cut that off and no longer be able to see it. I get to see it. I get to see who was who, who was brothers and sisters to who. I feel like the history like this isn't taught in schools, so there's no other way for the next generation to learn it unless they have ancestors or moms and dads to explain it to them. And I feel like if we can't do that, then it'll be easy for that to get lost. Our ancestors planted the seed. Uh, God let it grow, and our job is to do the work. So that's what we're here for. We're here to do the work, to work for our children and for others. Family of faith, growing by grace and that's what we believe in. And that's why we're the, the community we are, the family that we are. <laughs>